Thank you very much, dear audience, for participating in this very important event today. My name is Elisabetta. I'm a researcher at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs, and it was my utmost pleasure and honor to open the first discussion of the Riga Security Forum 2022 final event. Now, prior to starting, I want to um, point to a very important technical detail. Everybody following us online, also on TV platform, on online platform TVNet, please type in your questions in the chat box and they will be passed to me with the help of my colleagues. Therefore, we'll be able to discuss um, more relevant questions to you. Um, now, more to the gist of this discussion, the Latvian Institute of International Affairs is proud to be one of the leading institutes to discuss the women, peace and security agenda in international relations. Now, the reason for including gender in the discussion on international security is related to us believing that this can bring about a more sustainable, lasting and inclusive peace. And this is also the reason why we have titled today's discussion as putting on the gender glasses, response to the war in Ukraine in the transatlantic security space. Now to discuss this very relevant topic, which I believe has brought us all to reassess some of our values, I have invited very, a panel of very distinguished guests. First, Baibe Breja, Breja, Assistant Secretary for Public Diplomacy at NATO. It's a pleasure to have you, Baiba. Gunda Reire, Parliamentary Secretary at the Ministry of International Affairs. Uh, good afternoon. And joining online, and last but not least, Lieutenant Conan Colonel Melanie Lake, Military Advisor um, to Jacqueline O'Neill on Women, Peace and Security Agenda. It's a pleasure to have you. Can you hear us well? Okay, if we can uh, make sure that we also hear Melanie, please. So, have we resolved our technical hip hiccup? Well, while we're doing this, perhaps I will start with a brief introduction on the few points I have brought to my own list of issues that I would like to discuss today. Uh, that came to my mind as I was preparing for this event. First, for the background of the listeners, the Women, Peace and Security agenda dates back to the year 2000, and it has been conceived as a body of several United Nations Security Council resolutions that point out that women and children, in fact, are disproportionately affected by military conflict. And therefore, the international community and the United Nations member states must strive to protect them and prevent them from any type of violence and military conflict and also help women's leadership efforts in peace building. Now the situation in Ukraine nowadays of course has revealed that the women peace and security agenda is as relevant as ever. We see that the majority of war refugees are women and children whether internally displaced or outside of Ukraine. We also see that in fact the Russian army is using sexual violence as a means to target the Ukrainian population. And eventually, I believe that nowadays gender has become as politicized as ever. Considering all these observations, I would like to bring us to our first question, and I would like to ask Baiba. So, you also have NATO strategic concept uh, 2022 on your table, of course, a landmark document that we were all looking forward to, and I know it also contains very important points on human security and the women, peace and security agenda in the eyes of NATO, reflecting its values. Could you tell me how do you think NATO is doing when it comes to promoting this very important resolution? Uh, thank you very much and thank you our hosts for organizing this uh, Ambassador Foundation, Latvian Institute of International Affairs. And I know that you have lost your leader uh, lately. <laughs> We have a new leader. <laughs> Internal <laughs> political developments. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would like to congratulate Andres Sprout for becoming an MP. And I look forward to working with the, with the new leadership in uh, as successful way as it has been. And mon maybe one day we also have a female leader of the Institute of International Affairs. <laughs> Aside. <laughs> um, Coming back to your question, indeed, uh, when our 
leaders and when we all were involved in the wild consultation process on drafting NATO's new strategic concept, we reached out to private sector, we reached out to non-governmental sector, to academic sector, of course, to the military and political leaders, civilian leaders, and so on and so forth, to really get the inputs what value do they see NATO? What do, you, what, what do they see as the most important future tasks? So the document that was created was not just an exercise from uh, drafting around the North Atlantic Council table. It was a very wide consultation process. And the issue around why NATO is important actually came out very strong, that it does guarantee that basis of security to its one billion population, that it does guarantee that platform for economic growth, for future, for, for education aspirations, for everything else, for its allies, 30 allies, soon to be 32 allies. But also, what it means that it has that basis of values that when we speak why NATO was established, it was very much around uh, the fact that to protect uh, the liberties, the democracy, and, and that associations that the uh, alliance was based on. And, of course, naturally, that's very much the, the concept of human security, where women, peace, security as a concept comes in very naturally. And that was formulated, as you said, by the UN in 2000. And there have been quite a body of resolutions and practical work developed around that. Again, NATO is a political military alliance, so we sort of narrow it down to what the mission of the alliance is. And, and the way we have formulated is that we include the issue of women, peace, security into everything that we do, around three main pillars, which is inclusion, integrity, and integration. So everything which, w and what it means de facto is that in the whole process from starting to plan and an operation from the intelligence gathering, from assessing the conflict, from, from prevention, from uh, mitigation uh, and, and post-conflict, there is that concept uh, included. And, and also currently uh, with the war in Ukraine, regularly NAC, uh, the North Atlantic Council, which is the highest uh, deciding body, receives briefings on these aspects, on how human security, how women, children uh, are affected. And as you rightly pointed out, Russia is using uh, the sexual violence as a as, uh, means of conducting its war in Ukraine, uh, which again uh, then for NATO as a political military alliance means that we have to uh, draw certain lessons the way Russians are doing that war. Because again, going back to the security, to the strategic concept of NATO, it says that uh, the concept of women, peace, security will be included in, in all three core tasks, meaning the deterrence, defense, the crisis management and prevention, and the work with partners or cooperative security which again then uh, in practice means that what we do is training, training not only our troops, uh, not only uh, making sure that from the outset our troops are preparing for operations know exactly and what and how they should do, but also for partners. So when we train partners, that is very clear uh, uh, that pre prevention of violence is sexual, uh, prevention of sexual violence conflicts and, and uh, the way the operations are conducted on the field is an important training element. Also for the United Nations, peacekeeper is also for others. So this is where the strengths of the alliance is. Uh, then, of course, uh, we will go uh, uh, in the next round of questions on, on Ukraine more specifically and, and then we can proceed with that. Thank you very much, Baiba. Gunta, maybe you can give the perspective of Latvia as a member of the international community. How well are we doing? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Els, but uh, well, actually I will give you my personal views, how I see it, and then as Baiba mentioned in the next rounds, we can go deeper in details. Uh, well, as you correctly mentioned, 22 years have passed since the landmark resolution um, on women, peace and security, and uh, actually, uh, if we look at at those 22 years, we can conclude that the world has become a better place to live. That's the good news. Uh, but now <laughs> to the bad news, uh, 
the gender snapshot 22 which is a report produced by the united nations uh, two really relevant agencies uh, actually has calculated that if we are continuing in the same speed and we are improving as i said then we will reach uh, mm, let's say uh, full gender equality in almost 300 years so that's the bad news. Uh, yes, and uh, with full gender equality, I mean not only, you know, anti-discriminatory laws or uh, legal protection, but everything we actually understand with real human rights, women's rights, and actually human dignity as such. Uh, of course, the world is diverse. Here in the democratic part of, of the world, we are doing better uh, than maybe in other parts, but uh, yes, this is the previous report. Uh, I'm not sure if this year has brought us uh, some good news. Uh, 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 I'm afraid that we will see in the next report that the situation is at least stagnating right now. Uh, we see uh, oppression uh, of, of peaceful uh, protest movements in Iran. We see uh, Russia's war and aggression in Ukraine. And uh, yes, but once again, uh, as I said, the world is diverse in, in the European Union. Uh, we are keeping the course. Uh, but sometimes, uh, I would also say that uh, if you're looking at uh, gender perspective and women's rights and women inclusion and protection of women's rights, we sometimes see the tendency of labeling, uh, well, like feminist foreign policy or liberal attempts in foreign policy, something like that. But uh, I would say that I don't see those labeling attempts as really positive ones because they, they have a potential to distract us from the very essence of the whole issue. And I see the whole issue more not as a feminist one or a liberal one, uh, I see uh, the whole concept of humanism here because we all, uh, we all are humans here and it's not about women or girls or children or men, it's about human beings, how we treat each other. That's, that's the basic, uh, that's the basic uh, I, I would say, the depart departure point. Because uh, also if you look at the women, peace and security agenda, such we see those two uh, sides on the one hand how women and girls are treated uh, differently uh, uh, during the conflict uh, and we are uh, of course referring to the violence and aggression and on the other hand how uh, how women uh, are included in, in, in all peace efforts or in the armies and military forces but I would say it's, uh, and it is uh, that is my strong conviction that today's agenda on, uh, in, in international relations and, uh, is not simply, you know, uh, let's say, women's efforts to, to break into the so-called traditional male spheres or male clubs. I really see this in a much, much broader perspective, uh, let's say, as a demand for equality, justice, inclusion, security. Uh, and also equal positioning of professional women uh, in the social hierarchy. And with the social hierarchy, actually, I mean also a broader concept here, because we, uh, yes, on the one hand, also if you, if you look in the European Union and, and in the democratic world on the statistics, actually, we can see quite good numbers here. But on the other hand, uh, we forget that uh, together with good opportunities, we actually, uh, we need also equal distribution of duties. So, which means that, um, and, and I like uh, the famous quotation of Ruth Bader Ginsburg here, that uh, she said that uh, women will uh, reach, well, well, I'm paraphrasing, you know, women will reach uh, uh, real equality only at the point when also men will take their share uh, in upbringing the next uh, generation, which means that we have uh, the same opportunities, but we still have also our KKK duties, which means that this uh, double effort, uh, which professional women actually uh, have to perform, 
they're exhausting sometimes. Uh, therefore, uh, yes, so my first intervention will, was a bit more, you know, general and conceptual. I promised to talk about real examples and, and what Latvia is doing in these times. But I really think that this is the departure point, how we treat each other uh, and uh, the departure point is equality in every aspect, not only opportunities, also in the aspect of duties. Thank you, Thank you very much, Glunda. Indeed, the aspect of human dignity, I believe, sometimes uh, disappears into the political narratives that uh, are, you know, directed at gender equality. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, I really hope we can hear you. Uh, and now, Glunda mentioned uh, the feminist foreign policy already. Now, Canada is one of the few countries in the world that has proclaimed its po foreign policy as feminist. How is Canada doing when it comes to promoting women, peace and security and gender equality internationally? Please. So, so uh, you, you know, know I, 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 and, and I completely, completely can, can you hear me just, just, yes, just uh, to start? We can. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so speaking about things like the femi foreign, feminist foreign policy and uh, feminist international assistance uh, policy, that is that was the driver behind uh, our creation of our national action plan, along with obviously um, the the Security Council resolutions and and the global drive for um, solid plans to implement uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325. The the good thing about having these and having these stated policies is that. Um, it means every time something comes up, we don't need to renegotiate the priority of WPS. We have these stated policies. We have set it at the highest levels. And, you know, that was one of the, the reasons why Canada was, was such an advocate for um, seeing the inclusion of WPS in, in NATO's strategic concept in, um, and it allows us to have that framework that we don't have to, you know, every time a crisis erupts, we don't have to renegotiate that we are going to approach this with a gendered lens, that we have to actually um, look at this with broader perspectives, look at the intersectionality uh, and look at how this affects um, people differently as we try to respond. So um, that I think is, is where those sort of declarations are really important, um, really on a domestic front. When when we talk about you know getting into to Ukraine specifically, and I will talk more about what Canada's doing there um, in the next round, but um, there's no doubt that this is a very gendered war, and that we'll be studying the gendered dimensions of this for years to come. You see women playing. I would say an equally important role in the defense of Ukraine right now in all spheres, in politics, media, security forces, volunteer organizations, keeping civil society running and functioning, raising awareness around the world about what's going on, fighting disinformation, and you know even protecting the next generation by getting them out of harm's way. Um, and with all wars, we're seeing that women um, remain disproportionately impacted, whether that's economically, changing responsibilities, um, the rise of gender-based violence, domestic violence, use of violence as a sexual violence as a weapon of war, um, declining access to sexual and reproductive health rights. And, and all of this is happening in a global environment where we're seeing a regression of generational gains in women's rights over the last year, especially watching, um, as as some of my uh, colleagues on the panel mentioned, what's happening, what's happened in Afghanistan, Myanmar, um, Sudan, what we're seeing in Iran. Um, and I think really the defense in Ukraine that we're seeing is as strong as it is because this is a whole of society defense. Everyone is doing their piece regardless of gender, regardless of circumstances. And I really hope that, you know, this the resilience that comes from this is, is really recognized um, in the future. Um, are we doing enough? Is Canada doing enough? Um, I see one of the really important pieces that I think um, 
where we had the opportunity to contribute is over the last really eight years um, in democratic reforms, in supporting um, the, the democratic reforms within Ukraine, the transparency in government, that um, support to a free media that is able to credibly tell this story to the world, the, the support to active civil society and security sector reforms. Like there's no doubt um, that over really these last eight years of accelerated reforms towards Euro-Atlantic integration and NATO interoperability, um, Ukraine has firmly grasped the importance of gender equality and WPS in that pursuit. Um, you know, they, they brought in their first national action plan in 2016, second in 2020, and it's really being um, revised now in the context of the war. Um, but WPS really featured prominently in the the planning and review process for the annual partnership goals that um, NATO and Ukraine work towards each year with some really key targets towards like creation of gender networks, senior policy advisors within Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior, um, mainstreaming it throughout operational planning. So um, for Canada, we were able to, to help support that throughout the process and, and doing it, you know, very humbly as we were working on very similar things within both our own uh, military forces and our broader security sector. And and those have been key. Um, you know, that, that path to Euro-Atlantic integration has been a catalyst for things like Ukraine ratify, recently ratifying the, the Istanbul Convention on uh, preventing and combating violence um, against women. So um, all of this, the security sector reforms, um, breaking down barriers for women in security forces, I think Ukraine is really showing us now this feminist military narrative in sharp contrast to, to Russia, whose leadership seems to really have embraced toxic masculinity. Um, so what I hope that we can do as a country looking to support is is to continue on this path to keep you know sustaining the support to ukraine as a democracy um, to their democratic systems both federally regionally um, preserving these democratic checks and balance that are so critical to opening that space um, for women peace and security to thrive thank you very much melanie um, I think these are very, very important aspects that we should emphasize. And of course, also in the West, there's plenty that we can learn from Ukraine that has been able to put in place such important initiatives uh, that sometimes seem to be dragging here in, in the West too. But I want to, um, in fact, also point to, to the to the issues that we're still seeing. Despite the fact that the international community has made so many declarations and has put so much effort towards promoting gender equality, we still see problems and issues that persist. However, I think that the war in Ukraine has also made us react and even perhaps be proactive in our efforts to ensure that for once the Women, Peace and Security agenda is put in place in Ukraine. Bye, but perhaps you can tell me about what NATO is doing to that end. Thank you very much and uh, my big thank you for Canada leading the way also at NATO. That's been great and I'm wearing a uh, uh, Canada NATO scarf, uh, Melanie, who, who that was given to me by General Whitecross, and she was the first four-star general uh, in Canadian Armed Forces, and, and it was a great pleasure to work with her at NATO. Uh, also, currently, the uh, highest uh, serving general at NATO shape, Supreme Headquarters Al Allied Powers Europe, is a Canadian general, uh, Carla Harding, uh, top ace yeah. of logistics and we work very well with her, so uh, great job. With that, I want to say is that we need uh, more examples. We need a wider base of, of pyramid for women in a variety of professions. As far as NATO is concerned, uh, the, uh, what NATO needs is the best talent, the best talent independent of gender, sexual, religious orientation from the allied countries. And as far as civilian staff is concerned, almost almost half is women, uh, more than 40% currently. Also in the top leadership, we are at the assistant secretary gen general levels, we are three, uh, three uh, women. But in the military staff, obviously, it's, it's, uh, it's less, it's about 20%, which is a half more than 10 years ago. So we are on the right trajectory. But again, 
the uh, the leader leading by example and showing that uh, it's a profession uh, where you not only are a victim of somebody else's war, but uh, that you are a responder, you are a leader, you are part of that defense uh, of your country, of the alliance, of the population's territories and people. So in that respect, uh, what we are seeing in Ukraine is, is a war uh, where women are a critical force in, in the defense model of Ukraine. The whole resilience aspect, civil enablement of defense forces very much rely on Ukrainian women. On Ukrainian women, not you know, just in physical sense in, in providing that support, but also through their brains, through their informational uh, workforce, through the uh, uh, practical aspects of, of uh, supplying troops, uh, medical, assistance, everything, but also fighting on the front, you know, women, women are right there. So they are not just victims, they are actually active defenders of Ukrainian statehood nation and Ukraine's future. So they, they take a, a, a proper active stake. And that is where it's also different from the Russian war. Uh, so also this war is different in that respect that we see it played out. We see that uh, United Nations have taken a very active role starting from the stance of the Secretary General of the UN, very clearly defining that it is an aggression, Russian Federation's aggression against Ukraine. The, the numerous hearings in the UN Security Council with facts, with briefings from various UN organizations, including from the uh, uh, High Representative of Human Rights uh, of the UN, uh, Walter Turk, who was just in Ukraine and fully reported on what is happening there. So there is that, uh, including on, on, on human security aspects, civilian and, and women uh, uh, sufferings uh, there. So currently, Russia's war against the critical infrastructure is very much meant to undermine that Ukrainian defense model, the civil ena enablement, the resilience of the population. And there, make no mistake, Ukrainians will not give up because that is, uh, and this is what we see also from the years of training that NATO has uh, provided, uh, that allies have provided, that currently we are providing uh, to Ukrainians the assistance, the training, everything that willingness and ability to fight and defend uh, your country is, is unbreakable. So the, the task for all of us is to make sure that is maintained. And in practical ways, obviously, uh, again, there, there have been not only, you know, millions, billions of assistance that have been provided, but very practical, uh, practical help uh, to, to ensure that uh, Ukraine has that ability to fight, so the supplies, supplies, military, uh, lethal aid, but also non-lethal aid, enabling aid, uh, informational aid, uh, anything that is necessary, but also providing that future perspective. And I think that future perspective, that emotional angle, be it your Atlantic integration perspective, uh, the, the uh, future dream of Ukraine, I think, is as important in this aspect. So there, NATO, EU, UN, all the, all the countries, all the international world uh, that stands up for rules-based international order play a very important role. Thank you very much, Baiba. Gunda, what about Latvia? It has been, in fact, very often recognized as one of the top supporters of Ukraine, both in terms of verbal support, but then also in various international formats. Uh, yeah, as promised, now I'll uh, go deeper in, in activities, policies and Latvia's experience. And uh, first of all, I'd like to underline that Latvia is a strong supporter of the WPS agenda globally, regionally, uh, on the EU level, nationally, and uh, not only uh, well with diplomatic means or politically, but also here you as a as a think tank. Actually, you mm. we have a we have a really nice event today. Uh, we are spreading the message and raising the awareness. And actually, I see also our civil society partners here in the room, which means it's also civil society is, is engaged in the in this WPS agenda, which is uh, really this is really good news. Uh, yes. Uh, on the, e, on the UN level, uh, I must say that uh, we will see, uh, you know, the 
uh, the highest points of uh, our priority in this regard, I think in 2025, uh, when Latvia uh, will run for the United Nations Security Council's non-permanent seat. And I must say that, uh, well, the women, women's rights, uh, human rights, this is not a coincidence that uh, we will have also this uh, priority or this line uh, among our priorities because uh, human rights and women's rights actually have been our uh, foreign policy priority since the regaining our independence. Uh, it is not, you know, an ad hoc idea, well, how to, how to win the elections, yeah? Uh, this is uh, my first point. Uh, and why is it so? Because as a small state, uh, uh, we can survive only in a rules-based international environment and with the help of this and also with the help of WPS agenda this is how we are not only uh, raising awareness or fighting for, for justice uh, or gender equality but this is also how we are strengthening the international environment which is the only one uh, which is beneficial for us. And in the United Nations, well, not only in terms of uh, UNSC priorities, we, uh, we see this, uh, this agenda or uh, these policies. Uh, well, uh, in uh, 2023, Latvia will start working uh, in the executive board of the UN Women. For instance, uh, currently uh, we are in the UN Commission on the Status of Women in, in the... Uh, um, in the Vice in the status in the vice president, and yes, we are uh, strengthening this this agenda in every possible manner with the help of diplomatic, political means, and also with the help of our experts in different uh, institutions uh, and bodies in inter, uh, in in the United Nations. Uh, yes, if we are talking about the national efforts, uh, well, I have two or after uh, Polish ambassador's intervention, actually already three nice examples. Uh, first of all, uh, we have launched the UN uh, Women, Peace and Security Mentoring Program here, uh, here in Latvia. Uh, uh, I'm also honored to be part of it and I must uh, say that in the very beginning I was uh, full of doubts, what, I, what can I tell those young professionals and young women uh, but then it turned out that with our professional experience and actually everything we have seen in the world and in our professional duties, there are lots of things we can uh, at least discuss or even maybe teach uh, to these young women. And it turns out that it really empowers them. And that, that is, uh, I would say, the discovery of the year 2022 for me. It was uh, honestly a surprise for me how actually effective and interesting this mentoring program is. This is the first example. The second example is also, in fact, present today. Uh, we met with Melanie in the, during the Riga conference <laughs> in the side event, uh, which was, uh, organized with the help of the Canadian Embassy and yes, also with the help of Riga Conference and with the help of such events like to, today's, we are also raising the awareness and, and uh, giving also our share uh, to the whole idea. Uh, and I mentioned uh, uh, our Polish uh, <laughs> ambassador here. Yes, uh, actually also the opening of the Isa Ita Kozakiewicz monument uh, months ago uh, in Jakobils, we can also count this initiative uh, to the whole uh, WPS agenda here in Latvia because this is the way how we praise really, really strong women that have been part of our independence uh, struggles, uh, our independence movement. This is uh, a really, uh, it was a really strong political, intellectual figure in our uh, in our uh, history, uh, also a fighter for freedom, for sovereignty, for human rights, everything that actually we are still fighting for in today's world. So far about the national level. And now to Ukraine. Uh, yes, as, as you correctly mentioned, um, we are forefronters in terms of uh, if you look at our assistance in terms of share of GDP, we are <laughs> number one with our 0 0.92. Uh, and as we usually say, we must support Ukraine in every possible uh, 
terms politically, financially, militarily, but uh, also psychologically, also with every other possible means we have at our disposal because I can share a in a real, in a brief manner, my personal experience. A month ago, I was in I was in Kiev, during and well during that massive shelling, uh, we were sitting in the um, um, in uh, in the shelter uh, of the highest Rada, and uh, yes, and then we were discussing uh, all those needs and actually the full spectrum of needs. Uh, and, and help that is really uh, needed in, in Ukraine. Uh, and it turns out that our almost 1% of GDP or our efforts there uh, are very visible and very, very highly appreciated. Because uh, then, well, three weeks ago, um, the Women Rehabilitation Center in Ivana Frankivsk was uh, was opened in Ukraine. It is the western part of Ukraine, uh, which was uh, co-sponsored by the Latvian state. And uh, yes, on the one hand, it seems that of course Ukraine needs weapons. It needs money. Uh, it needs well winterization, uh, every possible, you know, uh, infrastructure. But on the other hand, uh, when we met uh, the first lady, Olena Zelensky, this is, this is the first thing uh, she wanted to mention during our talks by praising Latvia for our help uh, and our really humanitarian approach uh, uh, to the sufferings uh, in Ukraine. Uh, they know very well, of course, in absolute numbers, our 1% of GDP is not that much. On the other hand, Ukrainians understand very much that we are giving everything we have. And uh, they really appreciate uh, the opening of the center when we, where we help women that have survived sexual um, violence uh, during this uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, they appreciate uh, the rehabilitation uh, well opportunities here in Vivari, uh, where we help uh, soldiers that are really, really wounded here. And I must say that, yes, uh, in, in, in Ukraine, and if you're talking about the WPS efforts, uh, with the help of our civil society, and here we have LAPAS, uh, uh, which is uh, part of our National Action Plan, WPS uh, National Action Plan, or MARTA, uh, uh, which uh, this, this NGO was involved in opening of the Ivano Frankivsk Center. We are actually doing a great job on the one hand, and on the other hand, this is what we must continue doing. This is what we will do. Uh, Assumably, we'll talk about a bit later, but uh, Ukraine must win, and uh, we can help them with in 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 really really different ways. Also, with really psych psychological help, rehabilitation efforts, legal advice, and many other. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Gunda. Uh, Melanie, the floor is yours. Thank you. I just wanted to start by saying how inspiring it is actually to see the Latvian response and how much you truly have given. We had the opportunity when uh, my boss, uh, Ambassador O'Neill, visited uh, just after the Riga Security Conference to meet with some of those civil society partners, including Leto and uh, Marta Center, and hear about the tremendous work that you're doing. And it really is an example to the rest of, I think, the alliance when you see, you know, a country who is small in size but contributing an oversized uh, response so just wanted to to recognize that at the offset from um from the canadian perspective uh, wps on a global um on a global scale um i mean i talked about in the last in the last response um having a foreign feminist policy and international assistant policy so right off the bat everything we do um it's recognized that wps has to be integrated into that we have to do our programming our responses with a gendered lens on it um we're currently in the process of developing our third national action plan on women peace and security and that is 
I mean, it, it will undoubtedly be informed by what, what is unfolding on the ground right now. Um, but the other part of it is it's taking a more um, domestic approach as well. It's focusing on what we have to do internally to do better in terms of supporting um, women within our security sector, me full meaningful participation. Um, we do have a directive within our armed forces on implementing WPS. Um, and, and that is really aimed, we're doing a lot of work right now on how can we better support the mainstreaming of gender-based analysis, um, both on the military side within our security sector and as part of our national action plan. How can we better enable all of our government uh, departments to implement gender-based analysis because it's one thing to recognize that programming and responses need to be done with a gendered lens but it's a very other it's another issue to um, be able to build that capacity to do it in a meaningful and successful way so that's a piece that we're really trying to take on right now um, some of the other things uh, that we're focused on, uh, we are an active player in the WPS uh, CHODS network, Chiefs of Defense network. Um, we've recently participated in the uh, conference hosted by Bangladesh, who's currently leading that. Um, and with that, uh, looking, you know, that's that's really looking at how one of the one of the main aims of that network is increasing uh, meaningful participation of women across uh, UN peacekeeping operations. So one of uh, the the initiatives we've been really proud of and are working on sort of the next iteration of is the LC initiative, which is um, designed to increase uh, women's meaningful participation within peacekeeping operations and improve the environment that women are going into as they take that on. But to speak more specifically about um, what we're doing in Ukraine, so we really are trying to approach our response looking at that triple nexus of humanitarian assistance, development support and security. Um, without a doubt, um, the message is resoundingly clear out of Ukraine, both from, um, from all across political leadership, but including women leaders, that military support is absolutely critical. I mean, peace talks will start once once Ukraine uh, has secured a military victory. So um, that's certainly the first component that we have been looking at throughout. Um, so over a billion dollars in, in military equipment, but getting back into work with Operation Unifier, um, I mean, we were working on the ground since 2015 there, um, directly training Ukrainian security forces. Uh, I had the privilege of commanding that operation last year um, from March to October and really felt like we had we we had tremendous momentum both on reforms, but also on the integration of gender, building gender networks. and. I hope that we're able to continue that now that um, Unifier has resumed, really helping with that re continuous reconstitution of forces um, to, to sustain Ukraine's efforts, building specialist capabilities and working with our partners. We've had a lot of engagement recently with, uh, with our EU partners as they're standing up uh, their training mission. Um, another piece has been, and, and an interesting piece, I think, and where we see an intersection between Ukraine and WPS uh, on the global scale is with the diplomatic efforts and fighting disinformation. Um, one thing some of uh, the Ukrainian uh, political leaders that we've met with recently have indicated is asking for our assistance in reaching out to partners in the global south who have been really, really... Um, targeted by Russian disinformation about Ukraine. But it's interesting that um, WPS tends to be another area um, where Russia and some other uh, autocratic partners have used WPS as an attempt to divide Global South, Global North. Um, WPS has often been portrayed by Russia as something that's pushed onto the Global South by the Global North, but that um, really, really devalues the role that the Global South actually played in spurring. Uh, I mean, WPS and UN Security Council Resolution 1325 was very much an initiative born from women's groups out of the Global South. Um, 
So Ukraine has asked for our support in countering disinformation, using those diplomatic tools to engage with the Global South, both on Russian disinformation about Ukraine, but WPS is is an important component of that. Um, I think that you know the needs are just so great right now, and the stakes are so high that we we have to continuously ask ourselves if we're doing enough. Um, we we really are trying to push heavily on humanitarian assistance and make sure that we're taking into account the the special needs of of women, children, uh, and vulnerable groups as part of that. On the development front, continuing to really support the resilience of government institutions and civil society organizations, um, direct support to victims of sexual and gender-based violence, as well as um, supporting international efforts to investigate war crimes. Um, we've recently pledged funding um, for risk education, hazard mapping, and um, building capacity for demining um, and then also approving um, accountability for human rights violations. So uh, really, again, uh, trying to put a gender lens on that triple nexus of support. And, and I do just want to say, as we talk about um, military training and, and as we resume that, and many of our countries, so many of our countries are, are um, providing military support, it really is important to remember um, the women that are serving there. They continue to struggle with um, getting sufficient equipment in their sizes, you know, that, that often, and that's something that, you know, even gets overlooked at home sometimes. But um, equipment, continuing to push for um, reforms and legislation that protect those women in the armed forces of Ukraine. Um, in times like this, we don't talk a lot about um, the challenges that women face sometimes within their own security forces, whether that's sexual harassment, sexual assault. Um, but it, I mean, it's it's problems that women uh, grapple with in, in armed forces all around the world. And Ukraine was working on improving their legislation on that front, but it is an area where, where we still need, uh, I think, to support. Um, and finally, making sure that we push as we're training Ukrainian forces outside of Ukraine itself we push for the inclusion of women um, and and they probably will be in smaller numbers so we really need to make sure as we're providing that training that we do make sure that environment is is ready receptive and secure for them as they participate in this training thank you Thank you very much, Melanie. Um, can I just ask perhaps to in the meanwhile as we're talking here in the studio to turn off your mic? Uh, and then turn it on again. Thank you so much. Um, great. So um, I think uh, you've already introduced a couple of points that I think will come in handy uh, as we talk about the next steps. And here I would like to ask uh, the uh, discussants to be very brief as we already want to try to involve the audience. Uh, we already have some uh, follow-up questions that we would need to discuss before we finalize the discussion. So indeed, what are the next steps? We've, um, we've been emphasizing that there's so much that we've already done this year and we have been proactive but what else should we be doing Baiba, please okay so uh, nato does uh, a very specific audience polling in our allied countries both you know on a, on a more general level uh, so-called the the annual uh, polling but also on specific issues uh, nuclear deterrence and and emerging security issues and and number of other things and in all those, we clearly see that women women uh, have less understanding and less interest, but also they perceive uh, all the threats and, and issues differently. So quite clearly, also the communication, the outreach, everything that we do has to be very specifically uh, addressed to, to various uh, women groups, again, depending uh, what we are trying to achieve. So in our communications and outreach, we specifically include women, uh, again, uh, through the segmented approaches as, as a particular group of interest in our outreach. So that is what we will continue. <coughs> and if you see NATO's videos, if you see NATO's events, if you see whatever we do, you will see women everywhere. Women in uniform, women in non-uniform, women in, in uh, various uh, other roles. Then, um, 
we need to integrate, continue integrating uh, the gender aspect into future capabilities, military capabilities. We clearly know that the fighter planes, the bombers, the submarines, whatever we have, that they require actually specific adjustment for women. And again, because of these uh, tech-enabled future capabilities, they are different from what they were in the past. The extremely advanced, you know, future bombers won't have uh, people on them at all. But while they do, because we need that best talent, because we need, uh, because we have women training, we need specifically also to adjust uh, that production equipment and so on and so forth. So that is a very specific military angle. The cultural and relationship aspects within the military and civilian, and as Melanie said, the uh, respect for diversity and professionalism, uh, excluding sexual harassment, and that's a lot to do about training, but also a lot about relationships and making it really as a professional relationship instead of uh, having those gender glasses on in a, in a wrong way. And, and the final point is, of course, all that relates to cyber hybrid and other threats, where again, we have seen the whole uh, part of uh, action specifically addressed to women in the digital sphere and, and attacks against women and harassment and everything else uh, to make sure that through enablement, through mentoring, through professional advance, uh, not only we get the best women uh, with their skills on board, because actually it's in the tech sector where the women are least represented, where the highest incomes are currently and in the future, but where they are least represented. So there is a real digital gap in our societies in that respect. But also to make sure that women are resilient and, and uh, are not prevented through the specific gender-based attacks against them in the digital sphere from achieving their aims. And, and we at NATO, we have some of the best cyber people, some of the best uh, people in our, our uh, intel and other spectrums who are women in, in these uh, sectors. So, uh, and to, to young women, uh, through the mentoring, I always remind them, invest in yourself. I mean, oh, don't yes. have that internal uh, point of account accountability within yourself. Don't, don't listen when other people are telling you, oh, you know, because you're women, are you're not going to get this done or because, you know, you are this and that. Uh, that is not for you. Uh, just, just do your professional work and, and uh, you will develop on merits and not because you are one or the other. Thank you. Gwunda? Oh, yes. What Bibe said, that <laughs> reminds me of, uh, of the song free your mind and the rest will follow. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, sometimes, uh, actually during the Riggs conference there was a thesis about self-victimization, so uh, invest in yourself and believe in yourself that, well, that's, that's the, actually the first step you can, you can make on your own. But uh, uh, returning to, to your question, uh, and in the light of today's discussion, which actually, well, the, the biggest emphasis was put on, on Ukraine. Uh, first of all, I'd say that, uh, yes, unpunished crime is a repeated crime mm, uh, globally and also in, in, in regard also to Russia's aggression in Ukraine. This is why uh, Latvia is a really strong supporter of the creation of an ad hoc tribunal which could investigate and prosecute crime, aggression, uh, uh, the war crime, uh, war crimes. Uh, this is what we are uh, advocating for. Uh, of course, it will take lots of time uh, to find the best, let's say, the construction or the best institutional setting for such a tribunal. Uh, I know that there are also other uh, legal opportunities on the table, like some some hybrid tribunals and so, but uh, the good news is that the international society is moving uh, towards such kinds of uh, investigation and prosecution. This is the first point. The second point, uh, yes, unhealed trauma is an open trauma. This is why we will continue supporting Ukrainian women and girls and doing everything what's possible in terms of rehabilitation, legal advice, 
uh, how to support uh, women, but uh, as uh, actually Baiba correctly mentioned, in Ukraine, women are not only victims uh, of sexual violence or victims of war, they are also fighters, and I mentioned that I was sitting in the shelter during that massive bombing when towards Kiev, actually, well, but th this was uh, months ago, but uh, uh, yes, then we talked to Ukrainian women and they said, yes, do not underestimate us. Uh, one fifth of the Ukrainian army, these are women. Every fifth soldier is a woman. So uh, this is, well, the other side of the coin if you look at the WPS agenda. Uh, yes, and the third point I'd like to outline uh, about our future steps, as I said, we are running for the seat at the United Nations Security Council, human rights, uh, rule of law, uh, um, also women's rights will be definitely part of our agenda, part of our priorities. Of course, uh, the official campaign will be launched only in the second half of the next year, but uh, this is what I can promise you. This uh, WPS agenda and women's rights will be definitely uh, in our toolbox. Uh, in, in the campaign, in the elections, and hopefully also during our membership uh, in 26-27. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunda. Melanie, the floor is yours. Um, one of the things I think that we can really do as an international community to help right now is to be thinking about the day after the conflict ends. Um, this is something that militaries are notoriously bad about. We get caught up in the fighting of the day and aren't ready for the day when uh, when the fighting stops and we need to transition to stabilization and um, understanding how much Ukraine has on its plate right now, that is probably an area where we can really contribute and understanding that um, women have played a really important role in this and will be poised to take on new and emerging leadership roles in, in, in what the future of Ukraine will look like. I hope for that we are ready to, to to support that and help sustain you know that more active role even at the regional level that that women have certainly played um, another place i think is really important um, where there needs to be a bit of a push is for women's participation in the peace building process and peace negotiations. Right now, um, the negotiation teams have had a very low representation of women, and this is such a critical component to ensuring that um, that that they are actually successful. And it's particularly important, um, you know, on the political side when you consider that there is a very low representation of women at the senior level levels in the armed forces. So certainly an area where I think that um, maybe a bit of a push is is needed. Um, continuing to support the legislative reforms, like things like um, the ratification of the in Istanbul Convention, like there's about 30 draft laws that need to be revised um, in, in, in follow on to ratifying that convention. So certainly an area where, where we can help and ensuring that as we rebuild and, and redraft legislation, that gender perspectives are incorporated into that. Um, there is a tremendous potential or opportunity that comes from um, having to rebuild to build back in a different manner. Um, and the last piece I would say is just um, being ready to consider um, that we are going to have a large body of veterans that will need rehabilitation, reintegration, and and a big chunk of that will be women with different needs um, that certainly need to be considered and recognized as um, as. Ukraine looks to stabilize um, post-war, post-victory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. Now, um, in the best tradition of the Riga Security Forum, I would like to open the floor to some questions, please, over here. And if anybody else has something in store, go ahead and ask it afterwards, please. Hello, uh, my name is Ina Tielit and I am chairperson of uh, Women's NGOs Cooperation Network of Latvia. We are National Coordination for European Women's Lobby and also a uh, member of uh, Women Against Violence Europe. And uh, I was very pleased to, contribution, to hear contributions of our esteemed uh, panelists today. 
uh, and especially uh, learning about uh, zero tolerance towards any harassment and exploitation, about inclusion of women, uh, representation in a dialogue. But I think uh, there should be more of sharing power that is a feminist principle that should be observed in the future much more. And let me give you just a few examples. For instance, civil society has a dialogue with the European Commission. Together with our Polish uh, coordination, uh, last spring, uh, we, Latvian coordination, drafted the emergency motion towards European Women's Lobby uh, General Assembly uh, to include uh, amongst EU members and uh, countries in accession members, also Ukrainian and uh, Moldova women's organizations. And not every network in Europe has done before us, only the European Youth Forum uh, did so. And I think that uh, while uh, we provide services, our members provide services to women for rehabilitation, advice, uh, integration courses, education for children and support, uh, there are few issues that we cannot deal and which have not been addressed and that is the issues of those people, those women who are in occupied territories by Russia and who have no food and who have no um, means to support their children and who are threatened probably by fake news that if they would take food and drinks for their children from Russian uh, army then uh, they will be punished up to 15 years in, in prison. And to deal with such information and countering different kind of uh, malinformation, I think it's very, very important. Even uh, Madame Praja mentioned uh, cyber uh, security, but I think we should pay more attention what news comes to uh, refugee people across uh, the European uh, countries. Uh, second, reconstruction. It is very, very important uh, that women take part. For instance, when they were internally displaced persons uh, from eastern part of Ukraine years ago, uh, Latvian uh, Organization for People with Disability and we put forward a million worth project for European Commission because to support so those women yeah. with disabilities and single mothers uh, to enable them uh, uh, to uh, uh, be able to start job or start business or empower them for the work uh, while being displaced. Uh, the decision was to renovate the, the um, firefighters uh, station. Uh, of course, we can guess what has happened now with the firefighter station, and those women are still without skills, even being displaced must, or, or now being refugees. And I think the priority should be given to the bottom-up approach whenever we discuss the reconstruction of Ukraine and engaging those women. And meanwhile, we will help while having every month uh, meeting with Ukrainian women online. We will help to... to, to um, uh, make uh, witnessing uh, and, and uh, of, of uh, harassments, of sexual assaults, so that the crimes can be later uh, tried. Uh, we we will tr try to do our best, but I think especially it's addressed to <coughs> NATO that we need with NATO structural dialogue with women's NGOs. Mm. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Do you also have a question, perhaps? This was more of a remark to the panel. Uh, no, no, I was very happy to hear what uh, yeah. Eva was said by Madame Lake, and I think we have to learn a lot from uh, Canada's experience and from our yeah. colleagues. And my only question is to Madame Braje, can we invite her to General Assembly of European <laughs> Women's Lobby uh, to start the new, uh, new possibilities for dialogue? Thank you. <laughs> Putting Thank you, you on very the much. Spot. You, you can <laughs> always invite me. <laughs> Whether I'm able to be there is a different question. So I will make. I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, some more questions from the audience, please. Here. Um, hi. Um, Thank Could you very you much for all the insightful... Introduce yourself, oh, please. Oh, right. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I'm a student from the University of Oxford, um, and I'm also a policy advisor from the New Zealand Police. Um, I guess my question is, um, what do you see are the biggest barriers to keeping the momentum for some of the really incredible work that you guys have shared and done? Um, I suppose a lot has been talked about, like training and implementation of resolutions, um, but I take Melanie's point about um, implementation. Um, 
And as we know, there are lots of barriers to these to these kinds of implementations, whether it's financial or political. So I guess any general comments you have about that, it's an open question for anyone who wishes to take it, would be very useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody would like to start? Um, I think it's important to recognize that the concepts are there, and I think it was Melanie who said that, but you know, the documents, the policies, the concepts are there, so it's very much about doing that, what, what Ineta said, bottom-up type of approach, the practical work, and that is for the allies, for in, in our case for NATO, that's for the allies very much. Uh, having that triple helix, which is not just the government saying that this is what has to happen, but also that there are civil society organizations that are enabled, that there is academic approach with data and with very clear understanding that is that is needed, but also that the private sector and the actual, whether that's producers, whether that's the cyber companies or whoever, actually really takes that into account in their work. And, and I think this is where the, uh, again, uh, what our societies are about when we speak about challenges by authoritarian states to the rules-based international order, one of the answers very much is this whole society approach, and whole society is whole society, it's not just half of the population. Whole society in private sector, whole society in all the challenges, whole society in, in a civil military approach, and, and, and the best skills, the best responses, the best knowledge, the best integration, but also understanding that there are gender-specific aspects, especially to women, and, and such as we discussed uh, with regard to mediation or peace building where uh, women do approach and, and see things differently and their experience, knowledge and expertise is just needed. So that, that for me is the most important because the societies, our democratic societies and not only those, they are really changing. It's not anymore, you know, very much, you know, government driven uh, type of world we live in. Uh, the, the private sectors, the NGOs, academia play as an as important role. And when I look at our ambassadors here, I don't think they would have reached uh, uh, the, the top where they are now. Uh, have they always thought, oh, I'm a woman, you know, I will try a little bit my hand in the diplomacy. Let's see whether I succeed, right, ambassador? <laughs> You're the best, right? So that's, I think, my my... Uh, wish to to everyone just let's see you know what is the best we can do and and, and just just do it thank you Gunda? well since uh, all my life i'm sitting on two chairs also in academia <laughs> uh, in answering this question i will take the role of professor and refer to the school of social constructivism here and why because also here i would say that uh, the the real barriers actually are in our minds. And I will explain what I mean with that. Uh, I referred to social hierarchies in my first uh, uh, intervention. We all know about stereotypes and deep-rooted, you know, not only beliefs, but also deep-rooted uh, behavior patterns. And I will give you one really, it's not funny, it's disturbing <laughs> example. Uh, if you look at the Eurobarometer uh, uh, sociological surveys, uh, then uh, there was a spe special survey uh, uh, conducted in regard to gender equality in the EU societies. And uh, so citizens were asked uh, about is it correct or not that both parents actually should uh, take care uh, equally for uh, for children and also when they are uh, sick at home. And of course, uh, the results are uh, really beautiful and nice because uh, the whole society understands that the, that's the correct pattern of behavior. And then, if you look uh, at the data of the uh, our central bureau of statistics here, and if you take data that actually uh, reflect uh, uh, because uh, in our statistics actually you can find a uh, lot of information and if you look uh, which part of the society actually stays at home and receives those uh, compensations for the sickness leave when, when children are uh, sick then unfortunately 
I don't remember exact numbers, but some more than 80% of course these are women. Therefore, this is in our heads. We know the right answers, but our behavior somehow contradicts to them. So this is my answer to your question. Thank you very much. Melanie? When, uh, when you speak about keeping momentum, um, there's two things, two ways I see things going um, in a crisis like this. There are, uh, it's either an opportunity to, to push the agenda forward. And we've seen, uh, we had a visit from the Ministry of Interior a while back, uh, one of their deputy ministers uh, and the deputy chief of the National Patrol Police. And they talked about how they are not willing to cede an inch of ground in the reforms that they've made since 2014 on integration of women. And they're seeing the value of it as they are some of the first teams Teams to push into newly liberated territories and seeing the benefit of having these diverse teams, how they're able to um, engage with the population, but also the resilience within the team that comes from that. Um, and that deputy uh, chief of police, he said, we don't have the luxury of inequality right now. Um, so there are some that will really see it as as a way to build momentum. The flip side of that is those who think that in a crisis like this, um, there's no time to think about things like gender. Gender advisors are, are, are a side project that we'll get back to once things stabilize. And we really have to push back about that against that because this is such a gendered war. And it's not just about doing better for women, putting that gendered lens on this will increase their ability, their combat effectiveness on the ground, the overall operational effectiveness um, and ability to defend for their whole society. Um, when you talk about how do we keep that momentum, I think it comes down to really preserving democracy and democratic institutions while you're fighting for democracy, because you know there is risk there as things get really, really tense. There's risk of centralizing control, limiting the people who are making decisions. And we need so strongly to support civil society and free media, um, because those are the, those are the groups that will hold our governments to account even during these crisis periods. Women coming out of this um, this war, you know, the things that really boost your credibility and your confidence is experience. And I mean, women are coming out of this with such um, life experience skills. They are going to, without a doubt, um, keep the momentum going um, as they take you know, a new place. When you talk about power sharing, no doubt things are going to look different on the other side of this around the world and not just in Ukraine with what we're seeing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you very, very much to, I believe, excellent examples of the values encompassing the women peace and security agenda women leaders uh, that are not only here in the panel but also in the room thank you very very much for your time thank you very much for the insightful remarks and i think that i'm leaving this room with a sense of being really inspired uh, and i think this is a topic around which very idealistic and inspired people work around uh, so i hope we can all continue working together for the full implementation of the women peace and security agenda uh, and i'm also tasked with introducing the next panel that is going to be moderated by una alexandra berzin cherenkova it starts in half an hour so 2 30 and the title is the indo-pacific and euro-atlantic same but different so please stay tuned both online and and here in presence and I wish you all a successful day and also a lovely upcoming festive season. Mm -hmm.